talk to them. So what can be done now? In the short run, get some of the basic reforms. And the question you want to ask, how to make sure they can survive all these incentives in the politics. There's no point doing for three months something sensible, and then it all goes away. And then build a longer term consensus. For example, creation of reform. You can learn lessons from other places. Something that shocks me, actually, I'd say honestly shocks me, and maybe I haven't talked to enough people, but I've heard too often that people talk about, oh, well, shall we go to the IMF, or should we try to think for the 20, uh, shall we go for a 24th program, or shall we try to think of some homegrown economic program we will undo ourselves? And in fact, senior people told me, of course, then we'll have to find the finance ourselves. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of how the most effective countries have worked with the IMF. Bangladesh recently did a pre-crisis loan. Basically what happened, it went to the IMF. Before they had a crisis, they got a loan. A friend of mine in the Ministry of Finance said, oh, we're all quite pleased because they are going to be going to do all the things that we wanted to do anyway. And I had to tell him, that's the point. That's the point. You have a plan and you look for finance. And if you have a sensible plan, the IMF will fund it. And in this case, the IMF is going to fund the homegrown plan. That's how you work with the IMF. That's how you work with the World Bank. And not wait until they come and pitch a program to you and then see what it looks like. Where, when, where is that? Where, why is, where is that coming from? Similarly, how you communicate it. India was very effective. Manmohan Singh went out and said, look, we're doing these measures now because that's what it would look like. Read his speeches of in, in India from that particular period. They're just brilliant. You communicate and be clear that you do it with a clear purpose in mind. But you have to build credibility. You know, you may have those people who are in charge may have to do measures that don't somehow only hurt those people that don't support them and support the firms that are close to, the, to a particular government. So, you know, if you at some point do say, garment sector subsidies cuts, and then don't bring them back because somehow they're supporting you. You need to build credibility. Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore did something quite remarkable. One of his very first acts when he came to power was to jail the big business that had funded his election campaign. And he said, yes, you are totally corrupt. I'll put you in jail. Make, make it hurt for yourself. That's how you build credibility. You can do commitment devices. Iran did a brilliant fuel subsidy reform where they basically allocated cash transfers to people, but they put it on people's bank accounts, and they could see the moment Parliament was going to approve the fuel subsidy cut, it would come on their account. They did two-thirds of the cuts were paid out back into cash transfers immediately. There was no agitation on the street, because actually people kind of liked this. There was quite a big cash transfer, much better targeted than the fuel subsidies, and they handled it. Learn about how you actually design smarter ways and commitment devices. And then, I've mentioned already Mauritius, you have to be willing to see it through. You have to own it and see it through. So, that's my conclusion. Growth and development around the world happens, okay? Indonesia was predicted by a Nobel Prize winner. In 1968, it would not go anywhere. It was Gunnar Merdal said, we weren't going to go anywhere. By the 1970s, it was growing very fast. The advisor to the government at the time of independence, James Mead, another Nobel Prize winner in economics, told the Mauritian government, you'll never be successful. This, you're too stuck. The structures are too against you. And actually, um, they basically uh, then, as, as you know, started growing really fast. You know, in the, the writings about the Hindu growth rate started in 1979 uh, by, I think, Krishna Raj. And then uh, later on, also Deepak, Bal, uh, Deepak Lal had a, a book about it. And then in 91, it begins to grow really fast. In the growth rate, meaning, you know, oh, we can never be fast. You can do this. But there's no shortcut. You know, you need to somehow think through the politics and the economics, even with the short-term measures. There's no point to just pure to technocratically thinking. You have to get them through the politics and the nature of the elite bargain. And so you need to understand what they look like. Let me just finish here with an elephant. Because we were talking elephants anyway. I think, you know... I was looking for a picture of the elephant and who came up with Kavan. You will remember the elephant that was uh, in the zoo here and then was set free, I think, in Cambodia. I think it's maybe time to unchain 
the Pakistani economy, the elephant. It actually could be pretty big and very successful, but if you keep it on chains here in Islamabad, <laughs> it's not going to get anywhere. And that's where I want to stop. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I guess we have to cut down the question and answer session. We are running over time. Uh, he provoked you, and you might have interesting questions, but we can have that over tea. Uh, tea break is next. Sure. Let's have two quick questions, please. Well, this is Ishrat Hussain. My first edition of Pakistan, the economy of an elite state, was in 1999. And the second edition came out in 2020. So if you look at the benchmarking for the coalition partnership, our bargain for growth and development, we have actually drifted and deviated a great deal. So I'm quite impressed by your diagnostics, by your international comparisons, and the wrongs with Pakistan is, and I totally agree with you because that coincides with my own analysis and thinking. But I'm disappointed at the last part of yours. We all know commitments, credibility, communication, and others, but I don't find as to who is going to bell the cat and bring about the coalition or which will bargain for growth and development, which is escaping us. We know the external financing is a constraint and it's becoming a constraint, but look at the behavior of the last governments as to what they have done. They are not following the trajectory which you think what can be done. So I'm a little bit disappointed at your prescriptive part, but I totally say you have a first-rate analysis as far as the diagnostics are concerned. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Najib Nahteen, I happen to be from Algeria but that's not why I'm writing the World Bank here. Um, I have one question on whether it's Pakistan's moment. Through your presentation, you had two hypotheses to make you think it may be the moment. One, that oil, quote unquote, is running out, as in external financing. Why do you think this is the case? Second, that the elites are also losing now. What makes you think this is the case as well? More question from Yang side. And Yang says, so okay, no. No, she was just communicating to me. I'll be standing here later on as well, so if you want to keep on going while tea, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be talking to you. Um, so, so look, um, I'm disappointed too. I'm very disappointed that when you look at these places, it's very hard to actually say, this is how I, by, this is now I know exactly how change is happening. Okay, for the economists in the room, it's a bit like there's multiple equilibria. Your equilibria is unstable, the position is unstable. You actually have multiple directions you could go. You could go further down or you could change. But the one thing I know, it's all about agency and it's about agency of people here. And so at least we begin to narrow down the set. And in fact, my set gets narrowed down. It's people, not just commentators outside, but it's in the first instance, actually, those people within, within these elite positions that have a role to play. When you look at successful countries, we find brokers of these coalitions from inside. Okay, so people that begin to broker it. So that's one thing. As I said, you know, what can drive them is legitimacy. You can have the Deng Xiaoping. I don't know whether there is anyone there, and it, it could be lots of smaller than Xiaoping's uh, as well. The other part is, where I'm a little bit reluctant, I was reluctant to speak about it, is that I emphasize it comes out of crisis. And actually, virtually never is a legitimacy, sorry, is, a, is an elite that has power going to change it because it suddenly is worried about its own legacy or legitimacy in an abstract sense. It comes from pressure. It comes also from pressure from below. I'm very reluctant to advocate that because I look at the Arab Spring, 
there was a lot of pressure from below to change this arguably quite similar rentier economy as we have here to actually change it. I look at the outcome. I look at the outcome is that probably not a single population in the Middle East or in North Africa is better off after the Arab Spring than what it was before. So it brings my set of what is possible less. But I can only and at best ask that actually, you know, those people who have power and influence and are generally committed to it, strengthen those within the system that actually are beginning to do bits and pieces. Talk them up. We call them the drivers of change. Talk them up, support them. Maybe the outside community, take a few bets, not, not to the person who presents best to the donors, but somewhere that you see these things. So strengthen there. Because the point about these equilibria, as I said, they're not hard to predict. These changes are not hard, to, not, sorry, not easy to predict. We know what they should be, but it's very hard to predict. So your disappointment is mine because I can't give you the recipe for change. I know the ingredients. This is the same with your growth. I know the ingredients. I won't know what the recipe is that will settle here. Disappoint you then, yes. But for God's sake, if you were to expect someone coming from Oxford to tell you exactly how you will be solved, I think it would be wrong anyway. And I think you probably know better how it may be started to happen than I do. And I think it's people need to speak up and begin to think about it rather than another ivory tower Oxford person to do it. It's not a satisfactory answer, we talk more. <laughs> and I have this, and I want to give it quickly there. So why do I actually have hope here with that this may be the moment, okay? That this may be, be, be the moment. I said, you know, the external finance brings the rents. There's the cynic in me that's saying that if the elephant takes 60% and 40% is what politics fights over, even if the politics goes away, the 60% is still there, so why, do, why bother with politics? I.e. it could continue. I'm being frank here. But it could continue for a bit. And we know in countries, also in the Middle East, North Africa, that it can continue. And it creates this. Why do I think, though, that actually it is a potential moment. Despite all appearances, and sometimes the impression that's created, none of these elite players are monoliths. There's no monolithic elite. Sometimes people say there's multiple elites competing with each other even within the elite. That gives me hope that coalitions can be formed. But they will have to come from all the groups. There's no point just the economic journalists keep on writing always sensible things and nobody listening. It will have to come from within uh, within the establishment, within the military, within the civil service, but it has to be about somehow creating the space for change. It's uncertain, you know. Think of perestroika. Uh, per, um, uh, per, per it was very uncertain, and you see how it ended. So it is a gamble, but I wish that rather than being risk averse in the, in, the, in the elite and saying, look, we take the risk even if the rents go down, that actually there is a willingness to take a bit of risk and saying, because this is my simple message. The rents for the elite will be so much bigger if this country starts growing as well. There is a shared interest with a broad population, with everyone in the room, with the elite, to actually to, to get the, the cake to grow. But who will be the catalyst or what, it's just hard to predict, but it will have to be from inside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Stephen. Uh, very enlightening, provoking uh, presentation. The circumstances require that I do not indulge in flowery language, so I'll just come straight to the next session, uh, which is unleashing the agri-food sector. And we have our speakers. Um, I would uh, request them to come on stage. Uh, Ms. Amina Bajwa, Agriculture Development Specialist. Abid Kayum Suleri, Executive Director, SDPI. Amir Hayat Bandara, co-founder of Digital Data and uh, Agriculture Republic. Abid Amansa, Professor Emeritus Economics, LUMS. Oliver Durand, Senior Agriculture Economist, World Bank. And we have our moderator, Musharraf Zaidi, founder and CEO of Tabad Lab. Over to you, Musharraf Saab. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you uh, to PIDE and to the World Bank for organizing this really very uh, excellent uh, opportunity for so many of us uh, 
to engage with these issues in a serious way. This um, session is because it is the the session is that the Khosama Pashto Lik Kamzura de, the Esvaste Mafir Sochiake, Mapuri Ji Koshish Jerieo, Apni Jerry Madri Zvana, Mada Meri Madri Turdu Egi, like or Utanu Patabi Lagreoga. Like in Puri Ji Pashto, Sindhi should be my alternate mother tongue, but I'm really weak in that, so I'm not even going to try. Like in Menesh Pashto or Punjabi for slaughter, Tora Bot Karte Rana. Or uh, with due apologies to folks that are unable to follow um, if we break into Urdu or, or Punjabi at any given point. But I thought since the topic is agriculture and we want this conversation, I, I, it's a high level conversation and so far as the target, you know, it's directed toward people that make decisions. They're not sorry, I don't mean English on the air. But in the effects of this conversation, they are trying to convince people uh, they, those folks speak Pashto, they speak Punjabi, they speak Bravi, they speak... Uh, yeah, I know, there's a video. Let me get done with my little intro here. Thank you. So uh, I think without further ado, and because of the constraint on time, we've already done the intro. It's a fantastic panel. So Bismillah, let's see the video first and then let's see the video. The agri-food sector in Pakistan is facing a persistent paradox. It receives generous public support in various forms but performs below its potential. Each year, with the aim to stimulate agriculture production, the government distributes generous subsidies and minimum guaranteed prices to farmers. But despite this support, agricultural growth remains low. The nutritional needs of the country continue to be unmet and the agricultural imports keep increasing. Many believe that this generous support is misdirected, with the lion's share going to untargeted subsidies. This is undermining the agriculture sector's long-term growth potential and its environmental sustainability. Distortionary price, procurement and trade policies keep farmers in low-value monocropping production systems where they use too much fertilizer and water. Monocropping is when a farmer plants only one crop year after year instead of diversifying. Wheat, sugarcane, rice and cotton make up 80% of water use in agriculture but contribute less than 5% to national GDP. Wheat and rice production accounts for around 75% of the fertilizer and water subsidies. Why would farmers risk change when they have so many incentives to continue the way they have for decades? Meanwhile, the lack of diversity in Pakistan's approach to agriculture makes it more susceptible to shocks from climate change and global market dynamics. With more efficient and better targeted public support to the wheat sector, especially to small order farmers, I'm sure Pakistan can become one of the lead wheat producers in the, in, the, in, the, in the world. But for that, we really need to modernize the whole wheat production system, the whole wheat value chain. By being more efficient in producing wheat, meaning using less water, less land, Pakistan farmers, especially small farmers, would be able to diversify in more profitable, high value crops, for which Pakistan has a huge potential and real, real comparative advantages. There are a lot of, you know, uh, opportunities for uh, high value crops on the inter international market and Pakistan should capture those opportunities. Among the agriculture sector's biggest successes is water use. 94% of water withdrawals in Pakistan are for agriculture, but it has one of the lowest water productivity rates in the world. The irrigation system does not offer the reliability and flexibility needed by farmers to shift to diversified high-value production. Groundwater gives farmers a degree of control but is a depleting resource and will soon face stark competition from cities and industries. The current policy framework includes perverse incentives that are pushing the agri-food production system beyond sustainable use of natural resources. So you see minor improvements within the existing system uh, will not help Pakistan achieve its climate change, growth and food security ambitions. What we need is a drastic overall of the system. The irrigation system needs to be modernized, both the institutions and the infrastructure, uh, so that water supply becomes more responsive to the demands of farmers. 
uh, the agriculture system, especially agriculture financing, uh, needs to target small farmers and needs to incentivize shifts away from low productivity and water guzzling crops and towards high productivity and water uh, uh, conserving agronomic practices. And this requires a change in the policy framework, in the financing architecture, and the way we engage with farmers who are ultimately the beneficiaries of the system and the biggest contributors to Pakistan's food ambitions. रवायती फसलों के खर्चा घटा आता है, तो टन फार्मिंग के खर्चा कई गुना ज्यादा आता है। जब तो रवायती फसलें पाक के तैयार हो जाती हैं ना, वो उस वजह से ये ना नो चाहिए तो खेतां जी सेल कर लेंगे, चाहिए तो सी मंडी जी ले जाके सेल कर लेंगे। तो इधर मध्य मुकाबले जड़ी टन फार्मिंग वो वेगी स्पेशल किसी बड़े शहर दी बड़ी मंडी दा सानू इंतजाब करना पड़ेगा सो वन ऑफ़ द मोस्ट टेलिंग पार्ट्स आई मीन इट्स अ ग्रेट वीडियो एंड एंड यू मैन ऑल ऑफ़ यू हैव एक्सेस टू द काइंड ऑफ़ द ब्रीफिंग पेपर दैट दैट कवर्स द द कोर फंडामेंटल इश्यूज दैट आर कवर्ड इन द वीडियो एंड दैट � कीन फॉर अस टू टू थिंक अबाउट एंड रिफ्लेक्ट ऑन लेकिन उन्होंने कहा कि वो सानु डर है सो द एक्चुअल मे बी मोस्ट इम्पोर्टेंट स्टेकहोल्डर इन द एग्री फूड सप्लाई चेन इस सेइंग यू नो वी फियर वी आर फियरफुल वी आर स्केयर्ड ऑफ समथिंग एंड दैट समथिंग एक्चुअली इस द स्लेट ऑफ रेकमेंडेशंस दैट � this, uh, you're asking to do stuff that is counter to our traditions, counter to the un interests that we have as we understand them, and counter to the availability of the different kinds of facilities it would take for us to be able to do it. But Kisab, I wanted to start with you uh, and maybe help us lay out. Um, I was insisting earlier this morning that you taught me macroeconomics, and, and quite rightly, you refused to acknowledge <laughs> that I was your student, which, I, which is understandable. But, um, but Consider all of us your students in, in this moment and tell us uh, what is the overarching situation in uh, agriculture and, and food security in Pakistan? Well, thank you very much, uh, Musharraf. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, well, I think I, in the first part uh, of this discussion, I would just uh, like to briefly uh, give you an overview of the uh, agriculture sector. And when I say agriculture, so I mean crop sector and livestock and dairy sector. So I would like to separate the two because most of the estimates that you get, so they get a very sort of blurred picture because they rely on the data that is both crop and agriculture. I think we should, uh, to, we should actually see that how individually crop sector is uh, performing and dairy and livestock is performing. So I will, in the later part, perhaps I'll also talk about the, the, the dairy uh, and livestock. Here, I would like to give you a brief sort of uh, overview of how Pakistan's agriculture is doing now, how it has performed over the last 30 years or so. There are some numbers. So there's a risk that if you give 30 years, then it will take a time. Lag no, I'll just so we uh, want a very only five minutes. I so three minutes, Mekarle, Taki, we keep, oh, okay. and we also get the group okay. involved. So as I well. think there is, a, there is a general uh, sort of consensus that the productivity uh, is going down. So uh, most of the studies, they have shown that perhaps the growth rates were high earlier on in 90s. Uh, and since, I think, uh, 2000 onward, so there is a, a gradual decline in, in TFP and even yield. Even I think Pakistan Economic Survey says that the growth in yield of major crops is going down. I think that's one part of it. The other is that if you separate the crop sector, so then it appears that, uh, well, we have actually done a study for the World Bank, which does show that from 1993 to 2029, uh, 2019, in the 27 year period, there has been a 1.5% decline per annum in total factor productivity. 
and why it is so, I think there are two factors behind it. And one is that there is a uh, significant sort of decline in your uh, production possibility curve. So that is shifting inward, that's one. Secondly, I think there is also the inefficiencies in economies of scale and scope. So we are not diversifying. That's it. I think this is what I would like to say in the first part. Thank you. That's brilliant, uh, Doc Sub. Thank you for sort of tolerating my interruption, and I expect and hope that other speakers will also be as kind. Uh, Amina, it seems like there's a lot of issues coming at us, right? There's the irrigation bit that Basharat spoke about. There is the clear sort of division between livestock and dairy and, and the crop sector, and then within the crop sector, I think this devastating figure of like a 27-year decline, like consistent of uh, one and a half percent, all the other data points that we've already shared. That's the situation. Uh, you've been tracking and working on and engaged in agriculture and food uh, security policy for the last uh, more than a decade now. Do you feel that the policy matrix that's available in Pakistan to decision makers, to bureaucrats, to provincial, federal governments, and that apply to the farmer, that that policy matrix is built uh, to purpose? Is it fit for purpose in terms of dealing with the current situation? Um, thank you, Musharraf. Um, so a quick answer to your question is no. Okay. Um, our policies are not aligned. Uh, for example, um, we have signed international frameworks uh, on climate. We have NDCs. Yet, on the other hand, we give 60 billion uh, rupee subsidy to fertilizer companies. And within that, more um, priority is given to urea use and not DAP. And DAP is considered a less harmful um, application for, for your soil health. So just as this, this is just one example, how the government, um, there are different departments, 41 federal ministries, they all work for their own agendas, but they sometimes work in silos and they do not talk to each other. There's no one body looking at the bigger picture, looking at where the overall direction is going. Um, and we can talk about some of the policies uh, and the flaws of them in detail after. Sure, that's uh, that's excellent. We'll get you know we'll get a few rounds in, and then we'll take it to the to the wider audience. That's really uh, helpful, and I think that example of the misalignment between Pakistan's climate commitments, not just priorities, but its promises and the actual decisions it's taking, it's literally a one hundred percent contradiction. So, so I think that's a brilliant example that shows policy misalignment. Bandara Sab, may. Uh, uh, I'm a little suspicious because the representatives, whether they're teachers, union, or in any other sector, they usually are the my-bop type of that sector. So first of all, I'm afraid, I have this fear that you'll talk about the small farmer's interests, but I suspect you yourself may not be as small a farmer as maybe we should believe. I, I, I just wanted to start on that kind of uh, sort of ice-breaking note. But you can tell me that the policy misalignment and the productivity is bad. One way to frame this is that you are the victim of this policy misalignment and uh, secular, like 27-year-long or 40, 50-year-long sort of slide. But the other argument that somebody might make is that as the farmer, you're the, uh, you're the perpetrator of this. Okay? Ultimately, productivity is your responsibility. So what are you guys doing? I, I know you're going to complain about everybody, the government and the private sector and, and provincial, federal. But maybe start with, have you done anything wrong as a farmer? Uh, thank you, Musharraf. Thank you very much. Urdu talk about Urdu. I'm representing small farmers and I'm representing small and small and small as a farmer. Look, if we have फार्मर को मैं अपने आप को या अपने छोटे फार्मर्स को या मिडिल लेवल फार्मर्स को विक्टिम कहता हूं तो इस कमरे में बैठे हुए सारे लोग उसको विनर कहते हैं जिस तरह आपने कहा कि वी आर एंजॉयिंग ऑल द सब्सिडीज यूजिंग 90% वाटर इन फाइव क्रॉप्स तो हमारी प्रोडक्टिविटी क्यों कम है एक तो एग्रीकल्चर को पाकिस्तान में 
دو نظریوں سے دیکھنے کی ضرورت ہوگی اٹھارہویں ترمیم کے بعد دو حصے ہو گئے ہیں ہماری زراعت کے ایگریکلچر کے فوڈ سیکورٹی اور ریسرچ ایگریکلچر کی جو ہے وہ فیڈرل کے پاس ہے لائف اسٹاک ایریگیشن انوائرمنٹ اور جو ایگریکلچر ہے وہ صوبوں کے پاس ہے اب مرکز کا کیا کام ہے اور صوبوں کا کیا کام ہے یہ بڑا ایک مزیدار سا قصہ ہو جاتا ہے سم ٹائمس جس طرح ابھی آمنا نے بتایا کہ کوآڈینیشن بہت کم ہو جاتا ہے ایون کلائمیٹ چینج کی جو منسٹری ہے وہ فیڈرل کے پاس ہے انوائرمنٹ کے جو مسائل ہیں وہ پروونس ڈیل کر رہا ہوتا ہے ان سب کے علیحدہ علیحدہ وزیر ہیں اور علیحدہ علیحدہ ہی سیکرٹریز ہیں جن کے آپس میں روابط وہ ذرا پھر مناسب قسم کے ہی ہوتے ہیں تو میرے خیال میں اگر پروڈکٹیوٹی کی بات کریں کہ آپ تو سب سے پہلے کاسٹ آف پروڈکشن کو دیکھنا پڑے گا جب جب آپ کی پرائسز بڑھیں گی جب جب تیل مہنگا ہوگا بجلی مہنگی ہوگی آپ کی ٹیبل پہ پہنچنے والا کھانا مہنگا ہوگا اس وقت پھر آپ انفلیشن کا رونا رہیں یا کوئی اور روئیں میں آگے بات آگے چل کے کروں گا لیکن تھوڑا سا میں آپ کو ان لائن کر دیتا ہوں کہ فائنانسز اس کے بعد آپ کا ایگریکلچر مارکیٹنگ سسٹم اور پھر تیسرا کلائمیٹ چینج یہ تینوں فارمنگ کمیونٹی کے ساتھ ملے ہوئے ہیں اور ان پہ آگے چل کے مزید بات ہو جاتی ہے میں نے پرسپیکٹو تھوڑا سا آپ کو دے دیا دیٹس ریئلی سپرب اینڈ اگین اے ویری ویری پرسائز فریمنگ آف اے ویری براڈ ٹاپک اینڈ پرٹیکولرلی گریٹ فل دیٹ یو ٹک مائی کامنٹس ان 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 گڈ ہیومر ڈاکٹر صاحب ابھی تک جو سب سے شاید میرے لیے جو برننگ کوشچن ہے وہ روٹی کی قیمت کا سوال ہے کیونکہ شورلی بھنڈارا صاحب از رائٹ دیٹ دیر از اے وکٹم ہڈ دیٹ وی نیڈ ٹو افورڈ دا فارمر دا فارمر از ان فیکٹ اے وکٹم بٹ الٹیمیٹلی دا پرائز آف روٹی ہیز ایسکلیٹڈ فرام ود ان آر ویری ریسنٹ لائف ٹائمز ون روپی ٹو ٹو روپیز ٹو فائیو روپیز ٹو ٹین روپیز ٹو ففٹین ٹوینٹی اینڈ ناؤ ان سم آف دا نائسر پارٹس آف ٹاؤن تھرٹی روپیز فار فار اے نان ہاؤ has this happened how is it that in a sector that is as subsidized alhamdulillah mashallah as uh, robustly subsidized as wheat our country's cost of roti for the end consumer escalates at really it seems like an exponential rate to ye kya ho raha hai ye samjhaye hum sabko musharraf there are uh, two food commodities uh, for which we have a minimum spot price Uh, wheat and uh, sugar. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, rice? Uh, there is a shortage of right, uh, rice, or rice is being hoarded and rice is not available. Or have you ever heard of uh, onion? Or have you ever heard of potato? Or have you ever heard of uh, uh, other food commodities which are actually being very uh, superbly and efficiently uh, being marketed by growers and consumers and market determines the rate according to supply and demand? Now, I think in case of roti, Uh, it uh, starts uh, with the, the provincial food departments when they, uh, through uh, the middlemen, they uh, uh, start buying wheat from the farmer. Uh, usually when they buy, and uh, Bandarasa would uh, uh, vouch for it, when they buy, they uh, give less rate and they uh, take uh, more uh, quantity of wheat because they say this wheat is contaminated and we have to refine it and we have to uh, actually uh, purify it. So they take uh, at least two kg extra Uh, per uh, 40 kg, they pay the price of uh, 40 kg. Then they sell it to the flour mills, and flour mills, uh, instead of uh, making uh, flour, they keep on sending it to Afghanistan. Now, look at the number of flour mills which are uh, registered in Atak, uh, and you will be surprised to know that uh, District Atak has more flour mill than the uh, rest of the North uh, 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 Punjab, this part of Punjab, uh, because it's on uh, KP border, and that's uh, extremely easy for Matak to take uh, uh, wheat and wheat flour to uh, Afghanistan and to uh, other uh, parts. So I think uh, uh, these uh, distortions, they are uh, actually affecting the price of roti. The actual uh, intention was uh, to subsidize the farmers so that urban consumer, they can uh, uh, actually uh, get uh, some uh, 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 cheap commodity. Now, uh, all the subsidy, and uh, I had uh, a chance to uh, look after Prime Minister's uh, Agriculture Transformation Plan uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, the, and uh, Amna and Bandara Saab, they uh, actually uh, uh, identified very uh, precisely. Uh, in Punjab, there was this uh, fertilizer subsidy scheme. Uh, and uh, every uh, buyer of uh, fertilizer bag, they could get uh, uh, some scratch card and they could get their subsidy. 
Uh, now, the, all the scratch cards were being removed from the fertilizer bags, and then the fertilizer was being shipped to uh, KP, because in KP there was no such subsidy. So KP consumer was uh, getting expensive fertilizer, Punjab dealer, they were getting all the subsidy. So these are uh, uh, the governance-led distortions uh, which are being created, and uh, to me, subsidy is cost of inefficiency. Uh, remove the inefficiency, let the system to be efficient, and you will find uh, roti and everything, uh, it would be market-driven price. Farmer at least would be able to get uh, uh, the due share. And the very last comment, as Bandara has said, the more we announce uh, uh, the subsidy, uh, everything goes in uh, uh, the cost of input. So uh, I'll be happy if uh, my uh, farmer, they are better off due to subsidies. Uh, I, as an urban consumer, I will have uh, no problem. But if the subsidy has to go to the uh, uh, pocket of uh, uh, the uh, input supplier, a uh, farmer, they do, uh, don't have uh, uh, cash in hand, so they have to borrow all their input uh, uh, on credit. So we need to rethink of uh, uh, this mechanism of how to sustain our agriculture. Doc Sub, brilliantly sort of framed, uh, and, and I think, you know, on this, where the subsidy is going and who's pocketing it, uh, the private banks that have a share in PASCO is where some of the subsidy is going, and it's going in a cyclical, circular manner. We have a circular debt crisis just in the wheat market itself, and I'll, I'll let the experts speak more about that. Dr. Sahib, what Sulehi Sahib has said, it seems to me that the original sin is the one that actually has made it easy for people. Forget the politics around this issue for a second. But this is the subsidy, या वीट फ्लोर प्राइसेस को हम कहेंगे आप शुगर का एग्जांपल भी ले सकते हैं अगर यही जड़ है इन सारी इनफिशिएंसीज की और आप देखें कि बात वो हो रही थी कि क्रॉप जो है वही रहता है जो उसको बदलना चाहिए वो नहीं हो पाता तो वो भी सब्सिडी की वजह से लाइवस्टॉक पे और डेरी पे वो फोकस नहीं है सिस्टम का जो होना चाहिए उस पे वो पैसे नहीं खर्च होते क्योंकि सारे पैसे जो है वो अगेन पास्को और वीट प्रोक्योरमेंट और उस सारे ड्रामे में जो है चले जाते हैं तो is the solution the removal of the subsidy? And is it that simple just from a mechanical perspective? Forget about the politics for a second. Well, two questions. I think first, uh, the support price, uh, and second, subsidy. First, let me uh, just briefly comment on the support price. I think the, the support price or maybe intervention in the market, perhaps economists were discussing all these issues in early 80s. And they settled all these issues that support price is not good uh, for the end farmers in the agriculture sector, because I think there are few farmers who benefit. And those subsidies actually are uh, pocketed by maybe more influential people. Uh, if I just link it with the subsidized, uh, with the uh, fertilizer subsidy in Pakistan, there was a study by uh, I think uh, by Mubarak Ali and, uh, and also Stephen Davies, I think they did it in 2013-14. So they have done very uh, uh, thorough sort of simulation analysis by taking, let's say, four or five policies, whether you uh, withdraw subsidies and what will happen if you withdraw generalized sales tax, then what would happen and who would benefit. I think their conclusion is that if you invest in R&D, and withdraw subsidy from, let's say, the gas, the feedstock that you give to the fertilizer companies. So then I think the major loser would be fertilizer companies. Both farmers and consumers will gain because the prices of the food will go down and the profits and cost of production of the farmers will go down. So the net loser would be fertilizer industry. Now, what is fertilizer industry? There are about... Uh, to the end user? and to the small farmer. It, do you broadly agree with this proposal, Bandara sir? I'll tell you a little bit about the detail of where the problem is. You don't have to worry about the Fauji fertilizer. I don't have to worry about it from any other thing. But let me uh, uh, share some details. Why are the things going on? Dr. Sulaiti has told you a little bit about the wheat procurement. Now, you can see that last year, यूरिया का जो मार्केट का गवर्नमेंट का डिटरमिन प्राइस था वो सत्रह सौ अठसठ रुपये था 
मार्केट में यूरिया वीट के दिनों में शॉर्ट थी 40 से 60 फीसद महंगी होकर ब्लैक मार्केटिंग के साथ वो 2400 से अट्ठाईस सौ रुपये में मिल रही थी जिस फार्मर के पास पैसा था उसने वीट यूरिया प्रोक्योर कर ली जिसके पास नहीं था उसने नहीं डाली उसकी क्रॉप प्रोडक्टिविटी डाउन हो गई अब ये तो आपकी प्रोडक्शन के मामले में उसकी जो प्रोडक्टिविटी आपने जो स्टार्ट में सवाल पूछा था कि क्यों कम होती है उसमें एक रीज़न ये भी है उसके बाद जब आपकी क्रॉप मार्केट में आती है तो एक बैन अवी इदारे की दो साल पुरानी रिपोर्ट है तीन सौ तरतालीस मिलियन डॉलर की सिर्फ पोस्ट हार्वेस्ट लॉस वीट मेज और राइस के अंदर है अब वो हु इज द लूजर इन दिस केस फार्मर एंड दैन कंज्यूमर उसके बाद आ जाती है मंडी के अंदर क्रॉप मंडी में इतना पथेटिक और बुरा पुराना सिस्टम है कि आपकी पूरी की पूरी जो ट्रॉली है वो कोई सौ टन के अगर आप लें तो वो उल्टी जाती है वहां पे अनलोड की जाती है उसके बाद दोबारा बैग्स में भरी जाती है 1100 हंड्रेड ग्राम्स का पर्सन का बैग होता है जो दो किलो के ऊपर उसका हिसाब रखा जाता है दैट इज नॉट यूजफुल फॉर द कंज्यूमर एंड द प्रोड्यूसर वो मिडल के पास जा रहा होता है वो जो वजन है उसके बाद वो जब वहां से तुल जाती है तो उसकी जो फाइनेंस का प्रॉब्लम आता है कि फार्मर को टाइमली पैसा नहीं मिलता जिसकी वजह से वो अपनी आने वाली जो क्रॉप है उसके अंदर इन्वेस्ट नहीं कर सकता सब्सिडी का फायदा उसकी फाइनेंशियल सिक्योरिटी है देखिए आप हमेशा लार्ज फार्मर की बात करते हैं कि वो बेनिफिशरी है जब फाइनेंशियल सिक्योरिटी नहीं होगी तो स्मॉल फार्मर जो गंदम काश्त करता है वो इसीलिए करता है कि और कुछ बिके ना बिके मेरी ये फसल जो है वो जरूर गवर्नमेंट के थ्रू बिक जाएगी या अगर ओपन मार्केट में बिकेगी तो एक सौ दो सौ रुपए के फर्क से बिक जाएगी आर्ग्यूमेंट हियर भंडारा साहब इज नॉट आई मीन वो गन कम बैक टू डॉक्टर बर्की ऑन द क्वेश्चन सब्सिडी पार्ट बट ही इज आर्ग्यूमेंट आई थिंक दर्ग्यूमेंट वॉज कि सिर्फ आप फर्टिलाइजर वाली सब्सिडी जो है उस, उसकी बात अगर हम करें कि उसको हटाने से मैं जानना चाह रहा हूँ कि आपका व्यू क्या है कि नेट इम्पैक्ट क्या होगा बिलियन रुपीज की सब्सिडी दी गई गवर्नमेंट ने उतना जी एस टी लगा के आप सब पैसे ले लिए सो एक्चुअली जो सब्सिडी है वो आपने पे की है सो गवर्नमेंट हैज रिकवर्ड ऑल इट्स रेवेन्यू दैट वेंट फॉर सब्सिडी इन द फॉर्म ऑफ जीएसटी सो यू आर पेइंग जीएसटी सो इफ लेट से देर इज ए विद्रॉल ऑफ सब्सिडी एंड इफ देर इज ए विद्रॉल ऑफ जीएसटी एज वेल सो आई थिंक देर इज ए विन विन सिचुएशन फॉर फार्मर सर दिस विल बी अ विन विन सिचुएशन इफ दैट इज अवेलेबल टू द फार्मर प्रॉब्लम यह है कि आप सब्सिडी दे के अब सब्सिडी दे के आप यूरिया बत्तीस सौ रुपये में बेच रहे हैं मार्केट में वो बैतालीस सौ रुपये की मिल रही है आप सब्सिडी हटाएंगे लेट सपोज हम सब्सिडी हटा देते हैं मैं फार्मर्स परस्पेक्टिव से बता रहा हूँ आपको आई एम नॉट टॉकिंग अबाउट के कंपनीज क्या कमा रही हैं या क्या खा रही हैं आपने प्रोडक्शन कॉस्ट को कम करना है वो किस तरह करेंगे आप पाँच हज़ार पर यूरिया लेके चले जाएंगे वीट की प्रोडक्शन कॉस्ट कहाँ पर जाकर रुकेगी हो विल अगेन वही रोटी वाला सवाल आ जाएगा तो यू हैव टू आपने फार्मर को सस्ती इनपुट किस तरह से देनी है दिस इज द क्वेश्चन ओके सो लेट मी ब्रिंग आमना बैक इन दर्सेशन सो I mean I'm hearing all this and I don't know anything about agriculture and food security uh, I know you do luckily and and sort of the rest of the panelists to main ye soch raha hu ki ye sara hum kyun kar rahe hain wo mujhe kisi ne abhi slide bheji before the session wo bhi koi interest group se munsalik honge I'm sure uh, I'm, uh, I'm 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 hoping not to usme likha hua hai ki jo is waqt international wheat ki price hai wo hamare Pakistan mein jo wheat ki price hai usse kam hai और हम काफ़ी हद तक ये जो सब्सिडी देते हैं वो डॉलराइज हो जाती है फॉर फॉर मेनी इनपुट बेस्ड एंड सॉर्ट ऑफ रीजंस दैट आई डोंट फुली अंडरस्टैंड सो व्हाई नॉट जस्ट गेट रिड ऑफ द सब्सिडी एंड स्टार्ट इंपोर्टिंग द वीट एंड फोर्स आवर फार्मर्स आई विल गिव यू चांस टू रिएक्ट बट फोर्स आवर फार्मर्स टू स्टार्ट क्रॉपिंग मोर डाइवर्सिटी ऑन देयर ऑन देयर लैंड्स सो ओके लेट्स लेट्स गो डीपर इन टू वट दिस इशू इज विद इन वीट सेक्टर लेट्स टॉक वट द वीट सर्कुलर डेट ये क्या है हम वीट प्रोक्योर करते हैं अपने फार्मर से हम उसको प्रोड्यूस करते हैं सारी ऑपरेशनल कॉस्ट और उसकी ट्रांसपोर्ट कॉस्ट गवर्नमेंट बेयर करती है उसके बाद हम फार्मर्स को एक मिनिमम प्राइस से हमने ले ली दैट इज़ अनदर थिंग दैट द गवर्नमेंट पेज एंड टू पे फॉर ऑल ऑफ दीज ऑपरेशन एंड दी सपोर्ट प्राइस ऑल्सो द गवर्नमेंट बोरोज the government borrows from the bank we know what the interest rates are today uh moving on um um 
हम मजीद इंटर प्रोविंस बैन लगा देते हैं होता क्या है जितना डॉक्टर साहब ने बताया वो एक जगह आपने पंजाब में बैन लगा दिया वो लीक हो जाती है इट गोज़ टू के पी फ्राम के पी इट गोज़ अक्रॉस द बॉर्डर द बेनिफिट इज़ नॉट बींग ट्रिकल डाउन टू वेयर इट हैड टू बी इंटेंशनल जो आपका फ़ायदा था वो आपको नहीं दे पा रहे देर फोर दिस सिस्टम इज़ नॉट वर्किंग द सिस्टम हैज़ नॉट बीन वर्किंग फॉर अ वाइल देर इज़ एन एनालिसिस वर्ल्ड बैंक ने किया था कि ओनली द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ पंजाब स्पेंड अप्रॉक्सीमेटली हाफ अ बिलियन डॉलर पर ईयर ऑन द वीट प्रोडक्शन साइकिल Do you think that's sustainable? Who is benefiting from it? अभी भी गरीब बंदा रो रहा है कि रोटी महंगी है So the system is not working. How do we go about it? In Pakistan, we have some very good examples of systems or sectors within agriculture that work. Rice is one of them. Why is rice working? Maize is another one of them. आप maize का देखें थोड़े से area के अंदर when you look at the yields, double triple हो गए हैं over a very short period of time. Rice, the government does not regulate the sector. The private sector drives it. International market or international prices के साथ you automatically sell. Local आपकी surplus या वो नहीं होती, shortages भी नहीं होती. Have you ever heard कि जी rice short हो गया है पाकिस्तान में? So when systems or sectors are market driven, everything automatically adjusts, and there the farmer profitability comes in. And mind you. in any sector for any sector to flourish or to be sustainable profitability has to be the foundation we all work for profit we should expect the farmer to do the same right now the farmer sees ke wheat ke andar unko fayda hai kyunki unko guaranteed buyback mil raha hai kal ko if you open up we, farmers are also growing rice why are they growing rice because they have a confirmed buyer who is an exporter unko pata hai in fact recently i came to know that over 50000 acres of land pakistan is also growing sustainable rice which means rice that uses less water lesser emissions and they're selling locally our farmers will do what benefits them yeah. and we need to bring about that change That's understood I, i think a great point dr sulari is pe yeah you see uh, mushraf i think uh, we are uh, uh, sort of uh, ignoring uh, the cost of transition so yes uh, uh, we uh, have to remove all these subsidies and market transitions and then we have to uh, think of uh, farmers uh, apprehensions as well uh, that who will be bearing the cost of transition and what's the alternative the alternative as amna rightly pointed out uh, uh, is uh, uh, for example uh, the quality availability of seed in case of maize only about 2 uh, uh, years ago there was a excellent uh, Uh, a variety of seed produced by prc uh, uh, garlic uh, g uh, g variety which was uh, giving very good uh, yield and uh, the farmers they were actually uh, dying to get its uh, seed now uh, the total allocated budget research budget for prc pakistan agriculture research council is 5% of its research budget is 5% of its total budget 95% of its budget is current budget uh, for bills and salaries now your prime agriculture research institute uh, which is uh, mandated uh, to do all this research and provide all the uh, 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 this uh, output to uh, farmers uh, if uh, all these sort of subsidies can be gradually uh, as you uh, said in the uh, beginning uh, converted towards r and d so that if uh, i'm sure that if farmers they can get uh, uh, a seed which will give them good yield uh, they will not be dependent on uh, uh, all this market intervention by the government the second thing is even uh, when we tried to uh, diversify for example uh, uh, governments uh, successive governments they have been trying to promote olive now one of the reason uh, we are not able to promote olive because in balochistan the farmers have told us uh, that uh, in the absence of any extraction plants where would they take their olive so even if they grow their olives and we, we don't have uh, those modern extraction plants uh, their olive uh, uh, production Uh, will not get promoted similarly in uh, uh, this uh, uh, color koha uh, uh, area uh, pindadan khan uh, they are trying to uh, uh, promote uh, shrimp farming now if you don't have uh, those uh, refrigerated uh, uh, cool chains or uh, cold chains that can take this supply uh, to lahore or islamabad pindi multan uh, what would the farmer do with the shrimps so uh, i think we need to uh, think of uh, this uh, transition it won't uh, change overnight but uh, yes we need to have a blueprint and we need to gradually start uh, shifting uh, uh, from this uh, uh, subsidized agriculture of uh, just three four crops 
uh, to more diversified agriculture. And my final point, uh, coming from rural background, in case of Punjab, uh, majority of the farmers, they don't do agriculture uh, on any uh, profit uh, loss uh, basis. Uh, they do it uh, because it's a stigma in our rural areas. If I am a, uh, I belong to a rural area and I go and buy a wheat flour, that is a stigma for me in the whole village. Uh, that uh, uh, what sort of farmer he or she is who cannot even afford to uh, grow his or her own uh, wheat. So they have to do it in any case. And in case of Sindh and in case of South Punjab, uh, most of the farmers, they are absentee farmers. So of course for them, uh, whatever they can uh, get per annum, uh, it's uh, enough for them. So we need to actually understand uh, the political landscape, political economy landscape of agriculture. And uh, gradually, of course, uh, try to uh, move out from subsidy, bringing in research and development, uh, whereby farmers, they can grow more and they can uh, uh, be linked with the markets as well. So if the markets are not there, as in case of olive or shrimps, even diversification, uh, that would not work. So, uh, just to kind of summarize, I think we're beginning to develop a bit of a consensus. One thing is that R&D, which we used to call agriculture extension, is very important. We need to finance it from some money. 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 We need to finance it I'm trying to use the farmer's language. We need to finance it from some money. I have a question. And then you give me a long answer. It seems, based on what Dr. Uh, Abid Suleri is saying, that if you think that you have to do a lot of things, 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 let's say, three years or four years or five years, that you have to do it, you have to do it, and 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 you have to do it, so that you have to do it. हाई एंड ड्राई ना छोड़ा जाए उनको ये ना हो कि सीड ना मिले या ऐसे इंडस्ट्रीज में ऐसे क्रॉप्स में उनको धकेल दिया जाए जहाँ पे सप्लाई चेन जो है वो इनकम्प्लीट है तो डू यू थिंक फार्मर्स वुड बी विलिंग टू एक्सेप्ट के इवेंटुअली हमने ये वीट प्राइस और शुगर प्राइस को खत्म करना है ये पहले ये मुझे शार्प जवाब दीजिएगा इसका मैं आखिरी मैं अगर पर्सनली मैं अपनी बात करूँ तो मैं कभी भी सब्सिडी के हक में नहीं रहा मैं कभी भी ये नहीं चाहूँगा कि मुशर्रफ या सुलरी साहब की जेब से निकला वो टैक्स मेरी सब्सिडी की सूरत में मेरी जेब के अंदर आए। सर वो बहुत से लोग हैं। आर्थिक की जेब में और वो बैंकों में और पास से लोग हैं। जा रहा है वो वैसे भी फार्मर के पास ही जा रहा है। मैं आपको ये कहना चाह रहा हूँ कि हम एक दफा ग अमना ने भी बात की आपको दो एग्जांपल्स दी दो बड़ी इम्पोर्टेंट क्रॉप की पाकिस्तान की मेज और राइस इन दोनों में गवर्नमेंट ने कोई कमाल नहीं किया इट वाज द इंडस्ट्री वो पैक देर बैग वेंट टू यूरोप गल्फ वहाँ पे मार्केट बनाई वहाँ से सीड हेल्प किया और फार्मर्स को कहा कि उगाओ वी विल बाय इट एप्तमा कहाँ है शुगर मिल एसोसिएशन कहाँ है फ्लोर को तो छोड़ दें इन्होंने कितने सालों से आपकी जो कॉटन की वैल्यू चेन है कॉटन पे अभी इस साल थोड़ा सा कुछ काम हुआ है और वी आर लुकिंग के कुछ बेहतरी आ रही है बट हमारी जो जिनेग इंडस्ट्री है स्टिल अभी भी सेंचुरी ओल्ड टेक्नोलॉजी के ऊपर है कोई उसके अंदर कोई बहुत बड़ा काम नहीं हुआ हमारे सीड्स के अंदर कोई काम नहीं हुआ तो ठीक है ग्रेजुअली इसको खत्म करते हैं सब्सिडी को बट एट द मोमेंट आप कैसे कह सकते हैं कि एक जगह पे आप फोर्सफुली डंडे के साथ असिस्टेंट कमिश्नर्स के लिए जरिए बीट प्रक्योर करें सस्ती कीमत के अंदर 2200 रुपए में पिछले साल और ठीक दो महीने के बाद वही मार्केट के अंदर आप लोगों को रोटी के लिए 4000 का मन मिल रहा हो इसका सलूशन क्या होगा सब्सिडीज से पहले आपको ये जो स्ट्रक्चरल और जो मार्केटिंग एग्रीकल्चर मार्केटिंग सिस्टम के अंदर रिफॉर्म्स की जरूरत है बिफोर गोइंग टू द एग्रीकल्चर रिफॉर्म्स एंड द लैंड रिफॉर्म्स दैट्स रियली हेल्पफुल आई एम फर्स्ट बर्की साहब देन देन यू सो ऐसा बट जस्ट टू ब्रिंग एवरीबॉडी इन जिनको समझ ना आई हो शायद द क्वेश्चन आई पोज टू माय ब्रदर बंडारा वाज आमिर बंडारा वाज वुड Farmers accept an elimination of the sort of the floor price, and he said, "A, he's personally not for it, but B, before we start discussing the removal of the subsidy, there are distortions and inefficiencies in the fundamentals of how the agriculture sector works that make it difficult to take seriously the proposition of a removal of the subsidy because." 
you can accept the removal of the subsidy if there's a system that will absorb the, the impact of that. And he's not sure, I think quite rightly, he's not convinced that, that that's part of the deal. Uh, Dr. Berkey. Well, I think the best uh, way to analyze anything is that you can conduct study and uh, just find out if it is beneficial for the farmers or not. I think I would just like to comment on on the, the wheat for a sort of support price. I think it should be realized that wheat is one of the commodities which is neither exportable nor importable, which means that if you import it, so you will have to give subsidy. If you import, export it, even then you have to give subsidy. So that's one part. Secondly, I think the, the border management is a big major issue in the case of wheat. I agree. Uh, rice uh, business was also uh, controlled by government until, let's say, 20 years, 30 years ago. And uh, they have devolved it to the private sector, and it's functioning very well. The point is that whenever there is a higher price in the international market, so irrespective of what uh, wheat price in Pakistan is, the wheat starts flowing out uh, to Afghanistan and back to, I think, even Central Asia. because. The country which gives subsidy, they cannot retain the wheat supply in that country. So it always happens that whenever international price is high, so we always have a, a crisis. So whether you fix the price, whether you leave it open in the market, so that will remain the same. The problem is that how you manage your border, why so much smuggling takes place, which is the prime reason why you have higher price of roti. So, uh, uh, Suresa, before I come to you, just I want to take this. Now we have this kind of superstructure of essentially governance, uh, what we call political economy. You pointed to it earlier. You have multiple, I think, in one of the videos or one of the comments, it was 40 different departments that are involved in this. Uh, border management is a great example of something you wouldn't think of first. If somebody said, make a list of all the relevant departments, so you say irrigation, ho gaya, you know, food security, ho gaya, agri, ho gaya, research, ho gaya. but you know, border management, is, it's an interesting one. I think there's a degree of uh, sort of discussion here that is linked to the fiscal uh, session that we had earlier this morning. Certainly, there's a part of this that is linked to the child stunting session that we had yesterday. So in terms of the end user, we're clearly not providing the nutritional impact that we need to through our food security and our sort of range of subsidies. And in terms of, you know, the, the, the kind of backlog, we are taking on incessant and unending amounts of both domestic and external debt, sometimes to finance these subsidies, uh, both on, on the external front, but certainly uh, domestically. Uh, and the hole keeps growing larger and larger. Amna, do you see any, I'm sorry, the question is much longer than perhaps the answer, but I want you to go into as much detail as you can. Do you see any way of reconciling the vastness of the spectrum of challenges that, that this topic, the agri-food agri sort of supply chain, uh, poses to us? Um, so that's a, that's a difficult question because there are just so many bodies involved. But what I personally think is, um, you have blanket or untargeted subsidies today, and you're spending a lot of money on that. You take that pool of money, and you sort of go towards targeted subsidies. And those should be linked to the outcomes that you want. If you want nutrition as an outcome, you invest in seed or R&D that produces nutritious seed, which is iron fortified. So you have to link that with outcomes. Now, for example, we, we, um, the government talks about, you know, they very proudly talk about how they keep increasing financing or agriculture credit. Now, that's a big thing because, look, no, in, no sector actually flourishes without investment. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of private sector investing in some of the uh, uh, agriculture areas, including livestock. It is largely a neglected area by the government and by the private sector. But when you talk about uh, banks and you, you speak or listen to the state bank, they say, oh, we've uh, extended uh, 1.8 trillion rupees to agriculture credit. And every year they claim that they, uh, you know, achieve 98% or 99% of their targets, which is great. But when you look deeper, you, you look at their data, you dig deeper, and you see where is this money going. So I did this little analysis, and we saw that 
the agriculture credit uh, is divided into on-farm and off-farm credit. So off-farm should be that credit going towards the industry linked to agriculture, and on-farm, as the name says, should be on-farm. Um, when we looked at the data, we saw that 46% of on-farm credit goes to three cities only, Islamabad, Lahore, and Karachi. Now, please tell me. The now, great centers of agriculture and rural life in Pakistan. Yeah. <laughs> so if we further look deeper and, and see the disbursement, rupee disbursement per acre. So the farm sector in Lahore, a half a million rupee disbursed per acre in Lahore, 2.5 in Islamabad, and 14 million per acre in Karachi. Now tell me, identify, can anyone identify farmland in the urban areas of Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad? I, I'm still like trying to understand how the agri-credit is working. So coming back to your question, uh, we need to prioritize. We can't just keep going for untargeted blanket subsidies. And even within the sector support that we are giving, we really need to look deeper and see, are 90% of our farmers who are smallholder farmers, are they the actual beneficiaries or the 46% uh, who are getting the uh, farm credit in these two three cities? So I, I want to turn this, uh, and sorry, Saab, I'll just come to you, but I want to turn this again to Amir Bandara. Uh, and what I'm going to ask him is, when he hears this conversation, uh, you know, this you are this conversation, right? Um, and you've heard Amna talk about yet another issue, which is the financing of ag the agriculture sector. And we know that ZBTL, yeah, I don't know what's the name kya hai, lekin, I mean, I stopped paying attention to it because it's essentially a vehicle for this, which, which I don't know what to call this. I'm supposed to behave myself, so I guess I just call it, I'll let you call it what you want to call it. लेकिन ये जो बात कर रही हैं कि ये इस तरह की चीजें हो रही हैं सेक्टर में जिनका डायरेक्ट फार्मर के ऊपर एक इंपैक्ट है लेकिन उस फार्मर को शायद डायरेक्ट उससे इतना कनेक्शन ना हो तो क्या आपको लगता है कि ये जो रिफॉर्म की बातें हैं ये आपसे जुड़ी हुई हैं डू यू फील लाइक द थिंग्स दैट आई एम नॉट सेइंग दीस रिप्रेजेंट द स्टेटमेंट्स ऑफ एन एलाई और डू यू थिंक कि हम सारे बेसिकली हाथ धो के आपके वो जो सपोर्ट प्राइस के थ्रू जो थोड़ा बहुत yeah, bahut zyada fayda ho raha hai farmers ko hum uske piche jo hai lage hue like like i want to understand ke what is the farmer think when they engage with this conversation because part of maybe the solution is also to recalibrate ke hum ye baat jo hai wo kis tarah frame karte hain i think jis tarah suleri sahab ne ki wo shayad zyada mufeed ho banisbat jis tarah main bar bar jo hai wo ek hi cheez ke piche jo laga hua hu dekhi jis tarah humne finance ki baat ki na zbtbl hai ya dusre koi bhi private banks le le अभी कोई एग्रीकल्चर लोन 28 फीसद पर चल रहा है और ये वो बैंक्स हैं जिसके अंदर वो जो 90 फीसद स्मॉल फार्मर हैं वो कुछ 6.7 मिलियन फैमिलीज हैं उनकी एक्सेस नहीं है उनके पास मोकेज नहीं है वो दे के जो पैसा ले सकें तो सबसे पहले जब मैंने स्टार्ट में आपको कहा था कि फाइनेंस एग्रीकल्चर मार्केटिंग सिस्टम और क्लाइमेट चेंज ये तीनों चीज़ें आपकी इस पूरी चीज़ से जुड़े हुए हैं स्मॉल फार्म को शायद ये पता ना हो कि फाइनेंस क्या है या उसको ये पता ना हो एग्रीकल्चर मार्केटिंग सिस्टम क्या है या आपको क्लाइमेट आपकी क्लाइमेट चेंज एडेप्टेशन टेक्नोलॉजीज का ना पता हो क्या है बट दे आर सफरिंग फ्रॉम दीज थिंग्स जब बैंक उनको 28 फीसद पे भी लोन नहीं देता तो फिर वो आरती के पास जाते हैं जिसके बारे और ये एक चीज बहुत वजाहत से मैं आपके सारे ऑडियंस को बता दूँ कि मिडल मैन इज द वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट प्लेयर ऑफ द वैल्यू चेन ही इज द गर बिटवीन फार्मर एंड द बायर उसका रोल बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट है लेकिन लिमिट करने की जरूरत है क्योंकि वो इतना शुत्र बेमहार हुआ हुआ है कि वो सारी की सारी वैल्यू चेन को मैनिपुलेट कर देता है जिससे हमें पैसे कम मिलते हैं आपको चीज महंगी मिलती है तो आप देखें कि एक फॉर्मल जो क्रेडिट है वो अट्ठाईस फीसद पे है तो जस्ट इमेजिन के इनफॉर्मल जो लैंडिंग है वो कितने परसेंट पे होगी सत्तर या अस्सी फीसद के ऊपर तो फार्मर को क्या बचेगा तो जब आप रिफॉर्म्स की बात करते हैं ना तो आप उस ताजर को भी एग्रीकल्चर वैल्यू चेन का हिस्सा मानकर उसको एग्रीकल्चर के टैक्स नेट के अंदर लाएं सुबह से मैं भी सुन रहा था कि एग्रीकल्चर टैक्स बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट चीज है मैं पर्सनली इस हक में हूं और शायद कोई भी ऐसा फार्मर नहीं होगा जो एग्रीकल्चर टैक्स ना पे करना चाहता हो लेकिन उसकी डॉक्यूमेंटेशन किस तरह से करनी है 
उसकी डॉक्यूमेंटेशन तो आरडी के पास है जिसको आपने ताजर डिक्लेयर किया हुआ है उसको तो एग्रीकल्चर टैक्स में रेंट बिल लाते ही नहीं है जब तक आप इन स्ट्रक्चरल रिफॉर्म्स को पूरा नहीं करेंगे डॉक्यूमेंटेड नहीं करेंगे इस एग्रीकल्चर इकोनॉमी को ना फार्मर को फायदा होना है ना कंज्यूमर को फायदा होना है पैसा वहां जाना है जहां लोग चीखते फिरेंगे सो आई थिंक रियली आई थिंक वेरी एनरिचिंग सॉर्ट ऑफ एन इंटरवेंशन एंड जस्ट टेक दैट टू डॉक्टर सुलेरी व्हाट व्हाट मिस्टर मंडारा जस्ट सेड वाज एसेंशियली वन दैट यू कैन इग्नोर द इंपोर्टेंस ऑफ द मिडिल मैन एज एन इंटरमीडिएटरी but that intermediation whilst a valuable function needs to be contained within some parameters because right now it's uh, he used a very typical sort of uh, vernacular for it but basically it's a free for all in terms of uh, whether the intermediation function has any limits and so neither the supplier is benefiting Uh, in any way from the subsidies because of the intermediary nor is the end user benefiting from those subsidies because of the intermediary and then concurrently uh, mr bandara talked about the um what he called the tajir the the sort of the industrialist or the the value addition part of the uh, the trader the value addition part of the chain and the degree to which that actor within the supply chain is being spoken of in the same way that farmers are constantly being targeted how much of this is resolvable in the near i mean you've already articulated doc say that we have it's going to be a long arc and that you need to go slow and you can't be sudden and whilst you take things away you have to make sure that you give the right things back otherwise there'll be disequilibrium that part i think uh, we're clear on lekin jo ये जो आरती का रोल है जो खास तौर पे सर ने दो तीन दफा हवाला दिया आई थिंक इट्स वर्थ रिपीटिंग एप्टमा जैसी जो बॉडीज हैं जो इतने ज्यादा सब्सिडीज ले लेती हैं अगेन रिलेटिंग दिस टू प्रीवियस कॉन्वर्सेशन एट द कॉन्फ्रेंस यू हैव ऑल दीज रेंट सीकिंग सब्सिडी हंगरी इंफ्लुएंशियल बॉडीज एंड इन दिस होल पिक्चर द गाय दैट वी गो इन ग्रैब द नेक ऑफ इज द potentially according to some farmers bichara the small farmer who you know is at subsistence because of the ecosystem ji uh, uh, musharraf uh, let me wear uh, the hat of uh, small uh, medium farm, farmer uh, why do i need the uh, arti for arti is my insurer uh, he uh, at time space for the standing crop and he takes the risk of uh, uh, the weather calamities especially at the time of uh, harvest arti is providing me the middleman is providing me uh, the storage facility so uh, when i uh, uh, harvest i don't have a place to store uh, uh, arti comes arti buys from me and stores uh, arti is my transporter i cannot transport it from my village to uh, the district headquarter where the food department or some other uh, this uh, agriculture uh, uh, market is so he transports it and arti is my lender so when no banks is lending me he is providing me uh, all these uh, inputs uh, on loan that i would be paying of course at a very uh, high interest uh, at the next crop now while we are regulating the profit of uh, arti we need to somehow either uh, strengthen our institutions to formalize all these functions so if i can have a weather based insurance system i will not be dependent on arti because now i know that uh, if anything goes up and uh, uh, up or down with the a uh, precipitation uh, or uh, temperature uh, my crop is uh, uh, insured and if i am a small farmer not able to pay the premium government can give me subsidy there government can uh, pay the premium for my weather based insurance uh, if i am uh, uh, not able to uh, access credit uh, the scheme that is initiated it's called electronic warehouse registry so banks have